Thank you. I'll hold my comments until the end so <clears throat> we can get right into our two named discussants. And if you've got questions um, after uh, Terry and Karen, that would be great. Um, so Terry, why don't you start off? Okay, so, uh, well, thank you for letting me participate in this. I appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna take a slightly left turn than perhaps uh, than our current speakers because I really believe that the issues that are problematic aren't how we come up with the clinical informatics system. It's actually the underlying knowledge below that. And I think that that's, that's where we're having to run into some issues. And I think NHGRI has done some remarkable things with multiple networks, but the question arises is, how are they being integrated across these different networks? So you have Ignite, and you have Emerge, and you have ClinGen, and each one has a different website, and these, these are not being integrated. So that's one of the things that, and we saw this earlier in the discussion previously with regards to the population and diversities. And so, for example, in the ClinGen activities, there's a lot of effort being put towards populations and ancestries. And as representative of CPIC, where we worry greatly about coming up with guidelines for pharmacogenomics, I will tell you right up front, the biggest problem we have is how we define those populations and how we define those guidelines. And they're not great. I'm the first to tell you that. And that's because we don't have really strong information or data with regards to these populations. And that's really where something like Ignite can really help as we move forward. But I think as we move forward, we do have to think ahead as to how we're going to unite all of these different um, initiatives so that they are sharing that information. I agree with Josh about the informatics uh, gap. I think that that's a big one. Um, I think there are two other issues that I don't think anyone really raised is how are we going to incentivize our institutions to pri prioritize the work uh, with regards to genomic medicine. I can tell you that at my own institution, that's an issue. Um, it's great in the research domain, not so good in the clinical domain. Kelly sort of alluded to it earlier. I mean, she, finally, she moved back in the last year, so she's familiar with it from the clinic standpoint, but we don't really have genomic medicine highly integrated in a, at Stanford, and yet we're one of the leading institutions that do research in genomic medicine. I also think that there's a question that um, I'm going to throw back to Eric is, um, should we be leaving uh, precision medicine implementation to the vendors? You know, are, is it really the vendors who, spent, I, I don't know that we have any vendor representation here. I know they come in at different places. I know Sandy has been involved in them um, and other people have as well, but I think there needs to be better buy-in from them. You know, is it the idea that ultimately we're going to have one vendor system? Probably not, but I think that there needs to be, is it a regulatory issue that there are certain requirements that each of these vendors must have something to do with it? So I think that that is also the issue. And then lastly, I think there's a big issue as to who is going to pay for all of this long term. And it's not just who's paying for the studies that we are all in this room doing either individually from the research perspective or from the network perspective, but how are we going to sustain the, knowledge, the underlying knowledge as it changes, and how are we going to keep that? And I know that this is a big issue for NIH. It's a big issue for those of us who generate the knowledge that then gets uh, translated uh, into the uh, general practice, but I think that we need to come up with mechanisms to deal with that as well. Thank you, Karen. Hi. Um, so I am a bioinformatics person with a leaning towards genomics, and I've been a member of the ESP for Ignite for like two and a half years, I think. And I want to thank Ebony for bringing me in to, to this project. I don't really see it as service. I see it as education for my benefit. And it's just been this wonderful opportunity. Um, and. So from my perspective uh, on this panel, I don't have answers to any of the questions that come up. I just have a lot more questions. And I feel like as a scientist, when I look at the, the projects that have, um, have come together through Ignite, I feel like the challenges are not so much scientific. We're on top of the science. I feel like the challenges are actually social and political. And that to me is hard. I, I'm used to, I'm used to science. I'm not used to dealing with 
all of these different kinds of people that, that we need to, to make implementation happen. And so the, some of the questions that, that I have that I think, I think Ignite is, is starting to roll with is like, how do, we, how do we engage the EHR vendors? They're kind of this black box that they, don't, they either don't say anything or they tell us how it is. But how do we actually engage with them and, and make, make the relationship work? Like, I, I, I find that challenging. Um, as, as a clinical informaticist, how, how do I guide my institute in um, where to go with precision medicine? And I, and I think Ignite has provided these really amazing demonstration projects that show an improvement in quality um, that when you use precision medicine in the clinic, and I think that we, we need to use these um, and, and this experience to take that back to, to our managers and um, really prove that this is something that, that our hospital should be investing in. And so, I mean, I think there's a lot of um, social hurdles to get over to do that as well. Um, and anyone who, who actually knows me through work knows that I'm really interested in um, standards development and interoperability. And I, I hate free text. I'm all about being able to communicate um, both verbally and computationally and using, using standards to do that. So how do, how do we guide the um, standards development committees? And the, these are very diverse groups. How do, how do we, as, um, as like the accumulation of these networks, guide those different committees to, to focus on the things that we actually need to move forward? Um, and then, then how... On, on the flip side of that is how do we encourage our systems internally and our physicians to get on board to use these terminologies and ontologies. So my own personal experience is, um, is with phenotyping and people really, they just want to write free text. They don't actually want, want to engage in, in um, learning about the phenotype terminologies and, and, and use that and that would make my life a lot easier. So that, that's like another challenge. Um, I think that the, one of the things that I haven't heard talked about today as well is, is return of results. So we've talked about getting things into the EHR, and, and that's great, but then how, how do we provide the infrastructure to actually take that back to, um, to the clinic? And, and that costs money, and it takes a lot of organization, and I don't really see anybody wanting to pay for that. So. These are just random thoughts that... Okay. Why don't I ask the speakers to respond to the two discussions? But we, we need to be mindful of our time because I want to give the audience a chance to ask questions. Well, um, I'll start by addressing... There's a lot of great questions there. Um, so I, I, I thought we could talk a little bit about um, engagement of the vendors, um, which I think is very important. I mean, regardless of what we say here, ultimately, um, at this point in the, in the commercial market, the vendors are, um, are going to be the ones who would have to implement any kind of uh, actual code changes. And so um, we, we have engaged uh, the vendors within the SIG group. We had them come give webinars. But it, it's been not a deep uh, bilateral exchange. Um, but there are um, a lot of us have um, that kind of bilateral exchange in sort of other parts of our professional lives. and. And so, um, you know, I know at Mount Sinai and, and our, our place, there's a lot of uh, discussion with the vendors about how to do this. And my overall comment about that is the vendors cannot do this on their own. They're, they actually come to the table um, somewhat ignorant of um, exactly how to show genetic genomic risks and um, or even um, what the appropriate standards are, what, what's the appropriate metadata. And so there's a lot for them to learn. Um, and they recognize this to their credit and have, um, I think, accordingly sought a lot of help around the country. Um, so I, I think there is a lot of ongoing conversation. It's not always um, within uh, groups like this, but um, it, the groups like this can help facilitate to a certain, certain degree. Yeah, I agree that there were a lot of great questions and issues raised um, by the discussants. Um, to, to extend on the, the vendor question, so 
As somebody within an academic medical center, there's some areas where I feel we have great relationships with vendors and there's some areas where they totally drive us nuts and, you know, and cause concerns. Um, I do find that through putting a little bit of a plug for the Digitize Action Collaborative, which is a collaborative um, organized under the Genomics Roundtable at the National Academies. Um, most of the EHR vendors participate in that, and we found them to be extremely helpful and engaging in that context and willing to work with us. Um, in general, relative to engaging with vendors and also this general sort of funding question, I mean, we are internally outside of grant funding opportunities, commercial opportunities, opportunities for internal investment. It really, there is a lot of pressure to look at economics and how you can interject and use genetic um, techniques in combination with clinical informatics to produce economic benefits to the institution, which becomes exciting to the institution and becomes exciting to, um, to the vendors as well. Lots of, you know, risk in, in going into those areas, but I think that there is increasing excitement and increasing views of opportunity there. So I'll, um, I'll respond to a, a couple of the questions also. So um, one of the comments was about using, um, about incentivizing implementation. And so what, one thing that I think could happen within, it, within um, IGNITE is to uh, define what are outcome measures to, uh, I mean, there's, there's outcome measures in terms of uh, uh, physician uptake and, and, and patient acceptance and, and, and so on, but there's also opportunity for uh, outcomes that could be collected on an ongoing basis from the EHR. And so reporting measures or metrics that could be um, looked at and could have a financial implication. And so if we're able to show that there's um, p potentially some some cost benefit of, of doing these kinds of projects that might help with the um, with incentivizing. Also, uh, there is a, a point about uh, capturing um, data as st as structured data. And, uh, and, and I guess one of the things that I don't think we brought up NLP too much, but uh, national language processing is, is is potentially important to consider in, in trying to find the the data that that we need from clinical records. And um, you know, I've, I've been in the the situation where I've wanted to uh, find you know do, do the phenotyping where you find patients that have complex conditions and see that the the ICD-9 codes or the billing codes aren't sufficient and they're messy and they're missing and they're, there's all kinds of reasons why that's happening, and uh, and so then you have to look into the notes manually and, and so having automated approaches to do that um, will, will, will be pretty uh, important for being able to. Um, find the data that we need to trigger a lit, uh, decision support and so on. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Lon? Uh, yeah, thanks. That was a very um, informative discussion. I have a question for Terry. Uh, so as I, as, as I can see, you lobbed a few grenades out there, and I, I think uh, <laughs> I, I counted three, and I think each of them could and arguably should engender some discussion. Uh, the first one was the communication and sharing amongst NHGRI programs that uh, probably should be taken up at, at some point. The second one was the vendor one. And the third one I just wanted to draw you out on to see where you were going with it, which was who should pay for this? And who should pay for what? Is it the data generation? Is it the interpretation? Is it storage? Is it update? W where were you heading with that? Actually, all of the above, because um, from my perspective, I'm, I'm on the data generation side and the knowledge generation. And so I worry about that because I know that uh, there's a lot of human involvement in that, and as good as NLP techniques are getting, I will tell you that a lot of that, for example, a lot of the knowledge is buried in tables, and NLP, for example, is not good at that. We can also talk about mining uh, EMRs. That's great, except that uh, anyone in this room who is a physician and or a patient knows very well that a physician oftentimes will make a decision to write down a particular code or a diagnosis because they believe that their patient will do better on a particular drug, but they know that to get that drug, they must have a certain diagnosis, um, even if they don't necessarily have that. So, you know, that old phrase, garbage in, garbage out. 
Um, so there's that piece of it. And then there's, this, there's the storage of that knowledge, the upkeep of that knowledge, the translation of that knowledge, and then the whole idea, I mean, in terms of the, the EMR itself, in terms of the healthcare system, some of that is built in at, for the payee system. I mean, that's the whole health insurance part. But that doesn't cover the cost. It doesn't cover the cost of building the system, the testing of the system, the translation of it. So I was really throwing a huge bomb. I wasn't just throwing one. It was, I was spreading it across the board. <laughs> um. About three or four years ago, a number of us around the room um, published a paper out of eMERGE called Barriers to Implementation. And I think as we hear the talk today, uh, we could argue that there hasn't been much progress. Um, uh, we're doing wonderfully at identifying the barriers. Um, but the, uh, <laughs> the uh, so we're, we're, we've identified our targets well. The challenge that I see is that virtually everything that we identify as a barrier is outside of the control of the groups that we're doing. We can't control the vendors, we can't control the payers, we can't control the healthcare systems. We can provide input and we can def, you know, define what we think are best practices, but in terms of actually having them move forward, we have no ability to really direct that policy discussion. So, so I have two questions related to the IGNITE meeting. One is, what are the areas within the barriers that um, would be um, good targets for research around things that we might be able to um, uh, actually do something about. And then the second thing is um, the opportunities presented now at the policy level by uh, the movement that seems to indicate that ONC is saying if you want to be a certified electronic health record, you have to have some degree of openness for applications that sit outside the EHR. So it's not the monolith that we've been dealing with for the last uh, uh, I can see Sandy drooling already um, because uh, he and I have talked about this a lot. Um, so we may, what are the opportunities that we would have going forward in Ignite or other things to study how we could get around some of these barriers through the use of applications that sit outside of but interact with electronic health records? So, so I think to the, to the two different points, you know, one thing that I do think is important for us to keep in mind is if we build things that, oh, if, if we build things that generate value, that demonstrate value economically, clinically, then, that, then vendors will go after, you know, licensing and, and adopting those things. So, so, so that is a mechanism for interacting with vendors and, and, and pushing things into, into care. I do think that in terms of enabling those things to come into play, a huge part of this is establishing, as everyone said, the interfaces, the standardized interfaces that would enable us to get at the specific kinds of interoperability we need to gather the data and, and deploy this infrastructure. And that again, I do think the best way to do that is to demonstrate applications that expose interfaces that provide value to clinicians, that provide value to health systems, that, that then incentivize people to build other interfaces that enable them to operate. Okay. So Howard, then Chris, but I have a, I want to interject a question here on this thread. Maybe I'll put Lon on the spot. You're representing the entire U.S. Chamber of Commerce in this question. <laughs> um, why, why isn't the market working? You know, typically when these are they're outside this room, by and large, and there are these opportunities and obstacles, we, we trust that the market's going to help us fill them. But it, you know, going back, if indeed these are these these problems or, or challenges are years old. Where is it, are there not market incentives to help fill this void um, that we need to pay attention to? It, it seems that the, by and large, the the private sector is not working with us to to help fill these voids. Uh, so many thanks for that small question, Eric. Uh, <laughs> so I'm I um I work for GlaxoSmithKline in the drug discovery domain. So which is why Eric's probably picking on me on this. Um, so that's not a vendor in this context, I, I think, but it certainly is a consumer. And I, I guess I would I don't know the big picture answer to that. I could say the market is 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 working in oncology where targeted therapies, immuno-oncology, things are driving towards a precision medicine and, and we don't need to push it. I think it's going that way um, because the treatments are improving. 
It's not the case, in my view, um, outside of oncology and rare diseases, broadly. L lack of incentive, and I think actually one of the things I wanted to ask later, maybe I'll, I'll just ask it right now, is if you think of, um, if you think of pharma drug discovery, before we even start a research program, we go ask the payers what they want, right? And here, we're doing all this research and then asking what they want. And the risk there is we're gonna develop, conduct a whole bunch of studies and generate a whole bunch of data that isn't actually relevant to implement. At the end, I wonder if we should turn that question around and, um, and drive the discussion from there and you get the incentive so that they may not know what they want, but, but maybe we have the discussion and maybe we have the debate on what good data would look like that would actually move the needle. So Howard. So I'd like to thank the panel. I mean, I think you've hit on some of the key issues. I mean, when we think of informatics, we're all often thinking about from the sequence to the clinical report. But I actually think what you're touching on is how do you go from the clinical report to actual care is the biggest challenge. And I think Ignite in round two, if there is one, has some huge opportunities here to be thinking about it. I do not believe uh, that the EHR structure is designed to go forward with what much, much of you are talking about. Much of medicine is, it's a, it's a patient comes in with a phenotype, we then do a diagnostic test. As we move to doing more and more sequencing and having more information available in advance, as was discussed earlier, how do you use the pharmacogenomics is already hard in that environment. How do you use it proactively? How do you have that information? And I have no confidence that the EHR structure is going to deliver around that. So I think this is a huge opportunity. You have data now from version one, and you have input from your physicians, but how do you move the decision support away from having four million alerts uh, that come up with this variant. And I think that this alert fatigue is another really big issue. And as we have conversations with physicians about this, they don't want more alerts. And so I think I Ignite has got some huge opportunity to really address that critical piece, which is going to be the barrier for genomic medicine. It's how do we enable the physician to practice medicine in a 15 minute time window? And I don't see any structure in place to enable that. So I don't have an answer, but I think that is a huge opportunity for this group as it goes forward, in, in my opinion. Go ahead. Um, so I was just gonna uh, say that I think something that's really important is to have somebody from the health, IC, health IT side on research teams, if at all possible, because I've, I've been on like clinical decision support committees where there are other priorities of the institution. So they have an allergy alert that's, that's going off way too often. And so they have a priority of what's, what's gonna have the largest impact. And so these genomic medicine projects may not bubble up to the top necessarily. And so have, if it's possible to include somebody on the team to actually take ownership on some of, uh, some of the, um, the implementation piece, I think that that's important. And uh, there's APIs within Epic that I'm learning about and um, within these vendors that, are, that make data accessible for ex you know, developing um, software. So I think that there's there's a, it's promising. Chris, last question from the audience. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to riff off your, your point, uh, Howard, and I, I think there's, there is a widespread expectation that, and Sandy, you alluded to this, the genomic information will be in a sort of the moral equivalent of a PACS system, uh, and that in silico evaluation or if a clinician would order an in silico test effectively of something that exists in that repository. But my question really is, if this is going to go forward, and, and Terry, your, your point about how do we coordinate this across NIH and frankly with, with digitize and, and other efforts, I accept the premise that the core requirement is really information transfer, transmission, and interpretation. That in my little brain translates to standards. And as usual, the nice thing about standards is there are so many to choose from. Uh, in the context of this problem, uh, to what extent can Ignite, again in partnership with other NHGRI and for that matter with other uh, NIH and digitized uh, you know, National Academy uh, efforts, 
really begin the winnowing process and the refinement process and the promotion process. It is a socio-political problem. I accept that. Uh, but I think there's enough mass momentum and gravitas across the groups that are, that are assembled on this problem to begin saying, okay, folks, you know, here's a rational way forward. And in the, I, vendors are willing to follow the lead of clear and, and, and rational recommendations, at least in my experience. This, this whole notion of having proprietary divergence for the sake of proprietary divergence. And it, if a separate industry starts to emerge, we want to get ahead of that industry making up its own darn standards, as industry tends to do. What can we do to promote the harmonization and consolidation of information transfer representations? I'll st so my opinion, there's only one way to really make this happen, which is what we need is we need a killer app that provides value to clinicians, that requires genetic data to be sent into it in a structured way. And if we can do that, we have to, I think we have to lead with providing the value to the clinicians through a piece of infrastructure. And then the interfaces into that piece of infrastructure that people will want to implement into their systems will what will truly drive standardization. I think driving from the standards towards the infrastructure, I think it's extremely hard to make that work. Terry, you want to add to that? Yeah, I just wanted to add two points. Um, one is uh, when we talk about standards, we're assuming we can define a standard. And that's part of the problem. So in pharmacogenomics, for example, not all clinical labs will define something the same way. And they will not test it the same way unlike other sort of clinical tests. If someone is measuring creatinine, we know sort of the values. So there's an inherent problem, and it's not just in PGX, it's in disease risk and, and other things as well, but that is a huge thing. And so when we talk about standards, we have to be a little careful there. The second thing is, actually, I'm just gonna build on what Sandy said, and that sort of builds on what everyone else has said. You have 15 minutes with, uh, with a doc, and I'm glad you have 15 minutes, because many with my docs, it might be six minutes. but the idea of an app, if, we ha if, if groups can come up with a way to convey the important information or knowledge that affects that specific patient, and we usually say, we talk about it in 30 seconds or less, then in fact you will get buy-in. You'll get buy-in from the informatics community, you'll get buy-in from the vendors, you'll get buy-in from the physicians who right now are not being trained in genomics, but ultimately will be, if you make it easy for your, for the participants, it will happen. So is it gonna happen in the next year or two? Probably not, but if we're doing, if, if NHGRI is funding research and networks to do things that are effective now, they're way too late. They ought, they're trying to do it for five years or 10 years down the road. So some of the ideas that are being talked about here, in fact, are, even though they are still barriers, we are coming up with better ways to address it. So I think that that's part of the issue. So I'm gonna take the moderator's prerogative and have the last words. Uh, you know, this session, in my opinion, it all boiled down to sort of working toward, you know, clinical decision support. And I'm gonna add for the long term in, into that, um, uh, that sentence. And I, I really think, I wanna thank the speakers the the the, the um, discussants and the audience. I, everyone, it was a fantastic session. The the two I, I think take home messages that I bring out for ignite is first the focus on interfaces at many different levels. You know there was an there were the, there was the technical side, the interface between the physician and the screen. There was the interface among data components that Casey brought up. There was the personal interfaces of, of multidisciplinary teams. I think importantly towards the end, the interface between the research community and the private sector. And I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. And then maybe building a bridge to the previous um, session is the interface, the social interfaces I think are important. Then the final point is, 
I, I think for Ignite is the importance of engaging very early non-traditional parts of this community. Um, there was some nice banter, I think, Mark and Howard about the importance of, um, in, you know, sort of engaging the payers very early in this process. And then I think towards the end of this session, <clears throat> we can extend that to the need to engage the EHR vendors, again, very early in the process. And we, we shift our focus of success from being counting publications to making sure we have a path to implementation. So the, the, the research that we're doing really is defining a path to implementation. So I think if we can keep all those things in mind, not only will Ignite be successful, but frankly, the, the entire community will be more successful. So I want to thank everyone for their, re, their engagement and for the ideas that came out. And I believe the next, I'll turn it over to Ebony, but I believe the next agenda item is lunch. Yes, and I want to remind people that Colette is going to email you um, the poll for testing for us to use later on this afternoon. She'll, she's also going to display the questions for the poll on the screen. So when you have time, I know um, we're doing a working lunch, so please just grab your lunch, try to eat fast, especially the ones that are um, going to speak in the next session. If you could try to um, be the first ones or allow them to be the first ones to grab their lunch so they can grab a quick bite to start the next session and then um, we can um, be eating while they're presenting. Thank you very much. We'll meet back here at one o'clock. Thank you.